So I'm Steve Howard. I'm Vice Chair of Sustainability at, at Thomas Sack. I used to be, I'm an ex-climate grouper, so I have, have a connection through to, to Helen long ago. And Helen and I are also on the board of We Mean Business Coalition together. Um, the, we're going to have an, a, a what's next panel. Uh, I think I'm just looking at Billy. Do we have time? Are we going to have a chance for Q&A and audience participation? I think it'd probably be good. Yeah, we will have, we'll make sure we have some time, time for that in this. Uh, we've got, you know well, Helen from the Climate Group, another colleague of mine connected through, uh, through Tamasek, Marat, who leads Pentagreen Capital, and uh, Ivy, who leads ESG for PwC here out of Singapore. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the sort of what next, but start off really with the implications of uh, why are we all here and what have people taken from it so far? So what have people got out of, out of today, out of this week, and what are they going to take forwards? And I'm going to go to you first, Helen. Thanks, Steve. Um, so we've been running summits like this. We started, obviously, we've run Climate Week NYC for the last, I think, Steve founded that maybe uh, 15 or so years ago. Um, we've been running it. Um, and what we found at Climate Week is there's a role for um, both those sort of big moments on stage where people make commitments or you kind of hear from CEOs and heads of state and so on. But actually, um, what we've started running alongside that is these days that are really centered around action. So it's about how do you take those commitments, turn them into action, whether that's through kind of panel sessions and really hearing about case studies that we've done today, or roundtables. I know lots of you have been participating in kind of closed door roundtables where you really get into the meat of the problem. And that's what we're seeing is incredibly critical because we've got still not enough climate commitments. There's not enough happening. We know we're not going fast enough globally, but there's enough that we can need to start moving on actually what do we do next and we often say great you've made a commitment what are you actually doing tomorrow what are you doing differently as a next step and that's what we're aiming to do with um, these uh, sessions today so i know that there's been a lot of discussion this morning we broke down into two groups so steel and energy so getting very focused on those problems and some of the conversations we've been having about you know hydrogen and what's the impact of the ira on kind of what how they're doing things in australia so seeing those kind of global linkages as well as right down down to the level of the company. Yeah, I think sort of your climate group's kind of a, a global action network, aren't you? Sort really? of, yes, yeah. yes, and yes. I, That's I what we aim to be. And, we're, and your uh, regional finance network, in a way, Mara, maybe you want to introduce Pentagreen, but also say what, this, what the last couple of days have, have meant for you and what you'd like to see going forwards. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, indeed, Pentagreen, we're a financier, so we're all about capital, finance flows, capital flows into sustainable infrastructure in this part of the world. So looking to contribute to the uh, solution of the challenges that we all spoke about over the last uh, three days or so, using financing, using capital, using different ways to finance uh, projects and situations. Indeed, our focus is uh, Southeast Asia, uh, with South, South Asia as a, as a second step. So emerging Asia, uh, if I can put it this way, uh, we're fortunate to be backed by Timasek and HSBC and also Asian Development Bank and Clifford Capital, which is another infrastructure financier here based here, here in Singapore. So uh, in, in Singapore and in this part of the world, of course, and when talking about climate investments, we uh, really uh, all love talking about these uh, trillion dollar investment gaps, uh, whichever part of the, uh, the climate uh, world you, you look at. And uh, therefore, of course, uh, capital and finance uh, needs to uh, play a key role uh, in, uh, in providing uh, the solution and helping the region to move uh, uh, on its net zero uh, trajectory. And events like this in the, the last uh, uh, three days, uh, uh, for me, uh, why could they be useful? What do I take away uh, from such events? Of course, uh, Often uh, the, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of discussion, a lot of talk. Uh, of course, we all talk about having some sort of actionable insights or actionable follow-ups uh, uh, as a result. Uh, I also find these events quite useful to move debate forward, right? And that's where I think um, uh, the, the, there, are some, there is some success if in everybody's minds they go away from these events where, where they feel that what they've been talking about for the past two, three, four, five years, somehow there is now something new, a new narrative, right? And um, I'm quite glad that in this event, 
the new narrative in finance is starting to come through. Mm. Uh, many years ago, or I've been in the infrastructure finance space for, for now a you know, couple of decades, close, close to that. And uh, ever since I remember getting into this space professionally, you show up at these conferences and there's always the big debate, hey, uh, we've got uh, the bankers say, hey, we've got so much money, where are all the bankable deals, the bankable projects? And then the project owners, the project developers get together and they all say, hey, we've got so many projects, uh, you know, why aren't the bankers coming, right? And there's, there's this whole constant debate, where are the bankable projects, where are the bankable projects? And it's often the onus is being put, hey, it's you, the governments, you haven't put the right policy in place, or you, the developers, are not doing enough project development work. Uh, so if only we all kind of worked harder, or you, you all worked harder, then we bankers would come. And I think that narrative has kind of moved on to a place where uh, there's a realization that, okay, we are not going to get perfection out there in the world in terms of project situations, especially in the climate investment space. So everybody needs to take that sort of extra step, including capital, and hence all these topics around blended finance and so on and so forth. So to me, I heard some of those points come through throughout the last few days, and I'm very glad because we feel that it's only through this kind of understanding and these kind of insights that indeed we're going to find ways to finance the needs that are out there and that are very pressing today. You, you just are there, are there lots of projects and or and it, are, is there lots of money and lots of projects and but not the right intermediaries or is there not enough money or not enough projects? What, what's, the, what's the truth? Uh, to, to our mind, uh, the, the, the truth is something uh, along the following lines. Of course, we, we may be wrong. Uh, we don't profess to be a truth in the last uh, instance. Uh, the money is there. I think that is obvious. We, we're all convinced of that. Uh, the, the balance sheets of banks, multilateral institutions, insurance funds, pension funds, you name it, the balance sheets are there. Uh, the question over the last couple of years, or maybe even longer, well, oh, the projects are not there. Uh, the projects are also there, right? Uh, we as Pentagreen, uh, we, we uh, only started very recently, fully operational only from beginning of this year. From beginning of this year, we reviewed, I think uh, by my last count, 52 individual project opportunities. 16 of those we just passed. Okay, this is complete pipe dream, pie in the sky, it doesn't work. Four right now we're in deep diligence on. And there's the rest, about 30 or so, which we just don't have the, the manpower, the time yet uh, to, to really properly assess and evaluate, but which we think are lendable with the right risk appetite. So uh, to me, the, the, the gap is uh, the, the capital is there the appetite of that capital for the kind of risk that these projects present, that's where the disconnect mm -hmm. is. Uh, and uh, the question is how to bridge that disconnect. We think we have an answer and we, we heard a lot about blended finance uh, throughout the last uh, few days. Uh, but that's the uh, diagnosis of the, of the problem perhaps. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've seen, you know, we're, we're living in, if, if you wrote a novel, a fantasy novel, like say, let's say we'd, 15 years ago, we'd written a book about today. Uh, it wouldn't have, you know, you'd have had, uh, I'm not making a quality statement on this, but you'd have a, an oil uh, CEO in charge of the COP, an ex-reality TV star about to make his second run as president, uh, and, Ivy, over to you, ESG backlash coming at the time of a climate crisis. And sort of probably you're a bit in the thick of the ESG back backlash, um, maybe in PwC. How is that affecting your conversations with clients? How, how do you, has it affected things here in Asia? Absolutely. I think um, in one of our clients, the ESG, really deep into the ESG about 10 years ago. Um, oh, I think you're. Can you guys hear me? No. I can hear you. But... I can, but. <laughs> Hello. Yes, you look, that's better. Okay, fantastic. I'm usually quite loud, and I don't usually wear microphones, so I'm getting used to this. Um, Can you so, <laughs> so, in the we, last... It's just going to bring you, just bring bring you your mic, mic over. I think we can hold it up. Hello. No. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. 
So in the, in the last couple of years, I think with the um, different sort of noise from Europe, US, it's starting to have a bit of reaction, I would say, in Asia Pacific. And this is not a good, this is not something new, right? So in the, just PwC for example, we've been doing ESG reporting for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, right? But in the recent years, what I've noticed is that sort of, what's next, right? Now, the, the, there, I think there are two different type of reaction I'm seeing. One is a bit reactive, waiting for the regulator, waiting for the government to do a bit of a push and all kind of stuff. And the other part of the uh, reaction are from large organizations in Asia Pacific who have been on the global platform and have taken those steps ahead of time already. And what they're doing now is actually starting to bring along their supply chains, their stakeholders and everyone they're working with to move on this journey. In the last two years, what we're seeing, particularly in climate, um, is definitely in the center of the conversation. And this has an interesting effect on the companies, right? PwC has assurance tax and um, deals as well as consulting. So we are often asked a question, who are buying the services? And this gets interesting because we have CFOs, we have compliance officers, we have CEOs, and we have you know, the, 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 the supply chain people. And some people see it as so many different stakeholders, right, all buying different things. What does that really mean? Who do I really talk to? When we talk to our partners, how, what, you know, they ask, who do we talk to, right? And so I think starting, we're, we're seeing a merge of sort of conversation stakeholders to start getting to the top. It's getting a lot of traction and a lot of attention, um, particularly in climate. Uh, yesterday, we released the report. Um, and so we did a study on Asia Pacific ESG disclosure and mapped it against all the different framework. We all know it's quite complicated. Um, just on TCFD alone, I think it's the number is increasing quite fast from 26 something percent to almost 50% of short, right? So there's a huge jump. So the attention awareness are, are starting to get traction. So that's a very good sign. Um, coming back to the last couple of days, what I've heard, I think I've heard two things. There's a lot of positivities in prosperity events, right? People are talking about positive things, but there's another part where people are talking about challenges, challenges, challenges. The standard setters, the, um, they're waiting for um, the standard setters to talk to each other so company can better act. They're waiting for government to, to provide the right policies, incentives, et cetera, to move forward. And they're waiting for um, people like climate action groups to bring everybody together so they can sit down and actually have a proper conversation on a coordinated approach. We heard a lot of words like collaboration, collaboration. But I think it comes down to, uh, I would say two things. One is the sense of urgency everyone recognize, right? But the action, I think is still lagging behind because of that waiting um, for people to take action. And the second thing is that accountability when we talk about collaboration, everyone says, let's sit down and collaborate. Okay. And, right, who is doing what? So I really like what you just said in terms of the money's there, right? Um, government wants to do something, but are they talking to each other to actually divide and conquer and make an ecosystem that actually moves towards a, the right direction and accelerated direction as well? I don't need, oh. You keep that. <laughs> Helen, you, you've got uh, obviously momentum through the rest of this year. It's, it's climate week in like, practically next week. It probably yes, feels like, like next week. Yeah, yeah. And, and cop and things. Do you want to talk us through the rest of the year and what, what it might look like and what success could look like? Yeah, it's hard. I mean, so this is a challenging year from a kind of what's going to happen at COP perspective. Um, where it comes in the kind of cycle is... Uh, it's the global stock take, which means we're all supposed to come together. Everyone's supposed to, all well, the countries are supposed to count their emissions, come together and see how we're doing. But we know how we're doing. We're doing very badly. And the science is sort of showing us that we're behind. And so I think there has been a lot of worry uh, in kind of the system about the fact that COP will be held 
um, in the UAE this year. We've got an ex-oil CEO, as you said, uh, as president of the COP. Now, he is coming out and saying the right sort of things and his background as well. For those of you who followed back in the, I don't know, the zeros, Mazda, we always used to see those nice videos and stuff. That's kind of his, his uh, background. So it is a tricky one. I think Egypt last year was quite depressing, really, to uh, wander, not least because it was impossible to find your way around. And at one point, I was so lost, I thought I might actually cry. Um, and I thought, no, keep your dignity. But now I'm losing it by sharing that. But, um, but the fact that you could go into the Q8 pavilion and sign up to an oil pipeline. I mean, they were literally looking for investors there. So there's this weird mix where they kind of, as you say, the ambition sort of runs out ahead and the action sort of follows in, in pockets. And so one of the things that we're always trying to do is look for where those pockets are happening and kind of push them harder. Um, so I think you are going to see, um, we're seeing a lot now in our work with the Under Two Coalition and what's come out of that kind of sub-national group, C40 and others, starting to kind of rally around these um, issues around accountability and so on and starting to talk about how they're going to show up at COP alongside the national governments and start to bring that sub-national voice. We've seen the business voice increasing. So I'm not doing a very good job of predicting the future. I think we're in this very challenging period where on the one hand, you've got the war in Ukraine changing the kind of dynamics of the system in Europe and, and what Germany's doing, all that kind of stuff. At the same time, The Economist has said that it thinks it's actually brought forward the green transition by 10 years. So I think this is a really, really complex time, but actually looking at the work of what a lot of businesses are doing and how we're using that to influence policymakers and that interaction between businesses and policymakers. So I'm not sure how much people are waiting for each other anymore. What we see more of is actually that kind of sense of if we work together, we can start to design the policy together. We had the Asia Clean Energy Coalition this morning, which is all about we've got all these companies committed to RE100. They're all telling us that the hardest place to buy renewable energy is Asia. Great. Well, why don't you work together to help influence policy in Asia? And we've seen that the policy asks that RE100 put together have been adopted wholesale into the Korean um, plans, or word for word kind of thing. So that's a really good example of where businesses and policymakers are coming together to, to move, the, move the story onwards. Thanks. Um, Mara, we've probably, I don't know, maybe five years ago, there were hardly anybody had heard of blended finance, and now it seems like it's every third sentence yeah. has, has blended <laughs> finance in it. And it's, it's probably definitely more, more words of blended finance than actual dollars, poss possibly. But <laughs> we've, we've got like a, a, new, a new CEO in the World Bank just to declare uh, Ajay's ex-board ex member of, of Tamasek and... Uh, I've, I've been phenomenally Im impressed by him, and I think expectations run high of, of his leadership in, in the World Bank. Um, with, and you partnered with ADB, do, uh, are, are the MDBs going to step in in a new space? Are, do you think, are, uh, have we built up expectations in the developing world to disappoint yet again, mm. or are we going to see blended finance at scale that can really meet some needs? What do you think? Yeah, indeed, great question, and indeed, blended finance. I mean, the amount of times that that phrase gets repeated, and uh, uh, the, the other challenges that I think uh, probably each time that phrase is said, uh, something different is meant uh, by by the underlying. Uh, but I think, well, uh, blended finance in its in its simple terms is taking non-commercial capital from wherever it comes whether that's public sector, government, wealthy nations, philanthropies, whatever it is, and uh, putting it together with commercial capital uh, and that way to perhaps provide a more competitive cost of capital uh, and to de-risk the, 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 the commercial piece. Uh, I think certainly uh, there have been, uh, even in this part of the world, in the recent year or so, a number of blended finance transactions that were done on a, uh, nevertheless, on a sort of project by project, transaction by transaction basis. The MDBs, I think traditionally have had um, uh, somewhat of a, uh, I would say almost a monopoly on, on blended finance and on blended finance flows. And now we see a lot of different uh, entrants into the game whether that's concessionary capital providers or whether that's the intermediaries that help to channel that blended finance ultimately into the markets and into the projects. 
uh, we ourselves as Pentagreen is another example of such an intermediary. Uh, I think uh, we certainly think that uh, there needs to be more conduits. I think the multilateral stream and world is one conduit which does a very effective job at channeling blended finance to a particular part of the market. But we need more conduits and more experiments how to use blended finance. Uh, multilaterals, existing institutions, uh, often uh, are constrained by the way their uh, mandate or articles of association, uh, very fundamental documents that govern how they operate, uh, may restrict them in terms of what they can and cannot do. You know, World Bank itself only lends to the, the sovereign nations, IMF the same. And whilst, for example, IMF is coming up with a very uh, large concessionary program and has concessionary loans at their disposal, the construct is that IMF lends to the government and the government then lends to the, the, some other part of the government and then it sort of filters through. So you have a bureaucratic uh, construct and another bureaucratic construct and another bureaucratic construct. So the, the effectiveness of, of that flow, uh, you can see how uh, it it's, uh, may not be, uh, solve may not solve the problem in the near term. So we need more vehicles, more conduits to channel the, 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 the blended finance flows uh, into the markets. So that's number one. Uh, this, the second aspect of blended finance, uh, and going back to the, the, the point around, it's a blend of the commercial and the concessionary. The commercial capital is there in a big way, billions, hundreds of billions, uh, trillions uh, of dollars. The concessionary capital, that's where it's really the, the challenge. Uh, where are the big balance sheets that are able to provide that concessionary capital? Uh, that's the missing piece. And if we think uh, and if we believe, again, that the scale of the problem is trillion dollar gaps in whichever space we're looking at, and that, that's the narrative. So if we, if we believe that indeed the scale of the problem is, is, is in the trillions, then the size of the concessionary capital pool needs to be also very meaningful. It cannot be 10, 20, 30 million dollars. It needs to be very sizable, mm. right? And that, that is the somewhat of a missing piece right now. So Again, perhaps uh, jumping ahead a bit, but what I'm really hoping for from COP28 uh, and various other large uh, uh, gatherings uh, in, the, in the year ahead uh, is that that kind of leadership from an institution who is able to provide concessionary capital and is able to offer it in a big way, so write the big check. That is the game changer. That is the game changer. Any thoughts on who those institutions could be? <laughs> great, great question. Look, I think uh, it has to be, it has to be the, the, the governments of the so-called quote-unquote wealthy world. That, to my mind, is how it has to look. Philanthropy is yes, but philanthropy is ultimately these, these are, the, the, these are uh, private constructs, private individuals. So whilst uh, those private individuals uh, have uh, generated a lot of value and a lot of wealth, nevertheless, the uh, available liquidity there is fairly limited. So to me, it has to be the, the, the larger, uh, more uh, prosperous uh, governments uh, uh, around the world. And then perhaps uh, on the back of some strong signals and strong anchoring concessionary positions, the rest of the concessionary world, philanthropies, family offices, so on and so forth, can also be, be crowded in into that concessionary pool. That to me is how it has to play out. Uh, it's very often now when we talk about uh, concessionary pools, MDBs, we always talk about mobilization. And uh, uh, mobilization is great and we need to mobilize the, the commercial capital that's out there, that's the real big stuff. But somehow along the way, when thinking and talking about mobilization, we almost forget that in order to mobilize something, there needs to be an anchor position first, and then something can, on, can come in on top of that. So this anchor position uh, uh, from a, a concessionary provider, which to me are governments and maybe some of the larger philanthropies, that can have a very powerful effect to, to help stimulate this whole space. Cool. Um, 
it was a couple of years ago, Ivy, I, I, there was an announcement that PwC were going to hire 100,000 people on sustainability and ESG, and uh, lots of young people were polishing their CVs, PwC ready at that point in time, probably some older people as well, actually. Um, but uh, and how, is, how, are, how are you evolving in this fast-changing world? How's, how's PwC changing? And where might you be in two, three years? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, can you guys hear? Oh, forgot my mic. Um, so I think a couple of years we did announce, and I think that momentum continues to grow. Yeah. Um, and uh, PwC basically has a distinctive advantage of. Um, so essentially, our purpose is to build trust, and ESG is in the, in the in right in the middle of it, right in the center of it. Um, in the last couple of years, we've been very focused in terms of upskilling our staff. So when we say the whatever number that was quoted, I think that comes from two parts. There is a scarce of skill out there. We all know, right? The number is not going to magically, we don't, we don't have, you know, today we have five and tomorrow we're going to have a thousand experts. You don't have that many experts. But the idea is how ESG is not new. So there's a lot of that upskilling that can happen within your own organization. And that's what we're doing as well. Combination with the deep expertise that we have uh, within global already. So I think that's number one. The second thing is, I think, to working with the clients to upskill, to talking to the policymakers, and you know, it's an ecosystem of upskilling that's very important. And we are all still very, very much still learning. I mean, listening to the hydrogen conversation and how everything would work together, because it covers so many different topic areas. So we have different expertise, experts in just transition, in supply chain, um, in biodiversity, et cetera, all the hot topics. But then we also have um, staff that literally are very savvy in different topics, not just in one. So we support each other when we support clients. So That's you, how we work. You 10,000 people in? Have you 100,000? Do you know? I'm just, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you a number though. I'll tell you a number. Um, two years ago, uh, biodiversity, that, that was the emerging topic, right? And so we actually did a calculation on the number of bio, uh, experts we have uh, along the global network. And two years later, when I saw the number, I was very surprised myself, right? We have 5,000 experts around the globe, <laughs> right? Went from something like 800 to 5,000, right? A lot of people were already doing nature-related work, right? And so I think the, the, I don't like the word expert, to be honest, because I think expert means you really have to go really deep, right? But we do have 5,000 practitioners that are helping clients, right, on day-to-day -day basis, right? And then there's a, a lot of knowledge that's been shared around, and hence the more work you do, the more you know. As you've grown that team, you know, because Helen mentioned the fact that in, in Egypt you could invest in a, a pipeline if you wanted to, an oil pipeline, and which is slightly out of kilter with the COP. <laughs> do you have, do you, in PwC, do you have a debate about the clients and the projects you don't take as well as the ones you do? Interesting, we asked that same question to the leadership last year, October. Um, there are some debates about that, but fundamentally we are selective on what we do and what we don't do. Right, being an audit company as a basis, assurance company as a basis, we are being selective on who we support. But I think there's a very important factor when we decide is that during this transition process, particularly the likes of the uh, oil company, we have supported many um, in their transition. So it's not about not doing work, right? It's about help the companies in that area to go to transition to. I think that's the, that's the, um, the standpoint that we're taking. Okay, um, great. Uh, so, uh, Helen, you know, I'm thinking it was like on the run-up to, to Paris, things like, uh, you know, Climate Group was involved in setting We Mean Business up. It was really helpful in terms of, of creating the space for, for progress there. You, you set up RE100, you've done steel zero, cement zero, 
uh, EP100, EV100. So these, and I think they're really useful. I, for those of us that are in the sort of business settings, um, the, I used to be CSO in IKEA, and you'd get three initiatives a day. And the fact that you get sort of broadly backed, very clear action platforms, which say you can work with your peers, it's like, it, it's hugely helpful it's in, as a simplifier of what good looks like, and you can work alongside your peers in that. Um, uh, do you feel, are you, getting, are you getting more engagement in those today? Is, what's the interest level around that? Yeah, there's still a lot of interest in new joiners and um, Concrete Zero and Steel Zero are, are growing quickly. Um, and yeah, I think it's really important and on that clarity piece, and I'm sure you've heard me say this, but you know, we always talk about 100 and zero because if you committed to 95% renewable energy, say, that'd be a great target, but everyone in the company thinks they're in the 5%. It's like, oh, our company's doing great. They're, I mean, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but actually, 100% the CEO has to commit. You've really got to send that signal through the whole company. What I'm really excited about is how this is leading into then these conversations we talked about with policymakers. And so I think when it started, it was a kind of club of peers. Oh, we're doing it. You're doing it. Actually, what we're finding now is through our annual reporting cycles, we can then ask, what are the barriers? What's stopping you doing this tomorrow, essentially? Which is very different in the hundreds, where it's uh, renewable energy, electric vehicles. It's things like there's not enough renewable energy in Asia. It's things like there aren't enough electric vehicles on the market to go to 100% tomorrow. So that's one sort of set of problems where you can engage right now with policymakers and say, look, you know, this is how we need to shift look at all these businesses who are willing to back you. And for a lot of governments, uh, what they want to hear, in particular, you know, somewhere like the UK, where you've got a sort of centre, they're not really centre-right anymore, but right, heading towards the right government, um, they, what, what they fear is waking up tomorrow and, and the headline being business is like really anti, but to hear that business is pro some ambition. So we use that leverage was, for us was COP26 to get the UK government to say, right, we'll back a 2030 end date for the combustion engine in the UK, because they, they could see that UK businesses were gathered together and saying they would do it. And that's the sort of model we're now bringing with our Asia Clean Energy Coalition. And we heard um, independently the other day, some, uh, someone who was actually on the COP team had just been to Vietnam and they said, everyone we met in Vietnam is talking about RE100. And basically it's that sense of we're an export economy we're exporting to the, world, the rest of the world that is demanding that we're 100% renewable electricity. So we now have to meet that in Vietnam. That's incredibly challenging. But then you've got companies like Lego who are going out to the whole region and saying, we're gonna build our new plant if you can make it 100% and you get into a bidding war. And I think that's really exciting how, you know, that is a very kind of global approach where you're using that leverage of kind of the import export relationship and then engaging with policymakers. The zeros are quite different because they're about saying, I'm quite a visual thinker, so I think about the kind of S curve and in a way you're sort of starting at 2050 and saying, right, by 2050, we need to be at net zero steel. We know that. It, and we also, our experience the last few decades tells us we're not just gonna get there by hoping. We need to do a set of things now that get the market going in the right direction. And that's why the steel zero commitment and the concrete zero commitments are forward commitments from companies, you know, Volvo, Maersk, CIMC, who, who signed today, um, to say we, are re we want to be buying this in 2050. So giving, um, you know, that incentive and also that assurance to the supply side of the market who definitely has to make quite big investment and it's not easy to do and those technologies aren't all there yet, but that there is a market ready for them if they can get to it. So it's a kind of different... Um, model, but yeah, there's a lot of interest, and I've, you know, a few years ago we used to always talk about hard to abate, hard to abate, and we sort of dropped that terminology. Yes, those emissions are hard to abate in heavy industry, but actually the willingness and interest in those sectors is really picking up, and that's really exciting to see. Cool. Um, one question: If you th if you sort of cast your mind back a few years, we ago, then on the run-up to Paris, we didn't know we were going to get 600,000 people on the streets of New York. Nobody knew that a, a schoolgirl from Sweden was going to lead to global climate strikes and a, movement, a youth movement. We didn't know we were going to have a one and a half degree report that was very compelling on the science from the UN. We didn't know that the Biden administration was going to pull something out of the bag and have an Inflation Reduction Act and that the EU would respond with the Green Deal. Mm. Was, there were a whole host of stuff that, you know, actually 
momentum building and positively surprising. Um, and we're in this non-linear space. Does anybody have any thoughts on um, what's next in that <laughs> regard to go to the topic of the panel? Are we going to, I'm sure we've got some surprises coming. Do people have thoughts on what they might be? Yeah, I, uh, it's a fantastic question. So we'll do some uh, hoping and crystal ball gazing. But I go back to my favorite uh, topic, uh, and that's, uh, that's capital. And I think um, uh, we, we've heard, and even in these three days, and that seems to be now the, the, uh, a bit of a fashionable way to phrase it, is uh, uh, all the participants in the market, in, the, in this whole space, need to somehow lean in uh, to uh, to the problem, right, and do their and do their bit, not just wait for someone else uh, to 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 do their bit and do their uh, uh, so solve the problem for them. Um, and I think when it comes to to uh, to capital uh, and particularly cost-effective, risk-bearing capital, that's where I think we need somebody not to just lean in, but I don't know, maybe to le leap in or somewhere in the middle between leaning and leaping, right? Something like this. Uh, but uh, take, uh, take a, a big step forward uh, and be that anchoring entity uh, which is able to provide the kind of capital uh, that will be cost effective and will be able to bear the kinds of risks that climate investment uh, presents, particularly in the emerging markets, mm, risks that commercial providers should not take and not take, right? So that's, I think, what I'm uh, looking forward to seeing and what I'm looking forward to being surprised by is to find that kind of actor uh, in the coming months. Just to sort of build on that, we'll add to it. I think seeing what's the Bridgetown Initiative, which if people know about that, and I'm sure you two can talk about that much better than I can, but seeing you know, Prime Minister Barbados standing up and saying we really need to reform these institutions, but also coming with a set of solutions. I think that's really you know, good to see because we've had a lot of kind of, um, like you say at the COP, it's like you do this, blah, blah, blah. but where we've seen things really make progress, things like Paris, where it is much more about, okay, here's what we all need to commit to, here are things that we need to do, rather than coming with a set of problems. And I think that could unlock things much more quickly. And I'm really hopeful that I think you're already seeing that conversation around the World Bank change. That's from the outsider point of view, but I don't know if you're, you, you both are also seeing that. But it seems to me like that could be where the big surprise, well, not, hopefully not surprise now because it started, but the big change could start coming is that we really get into that conversation around risk and so on. If I may just, just add, uh, I'm uh, very uh, positive and more positive on the ability of the private sector to drive some of this change. And you mentioned RE100, EV100, and so on and so forth. RE100, I think, was a fantastic initiative, which essentially created a market for things like rooftop solar, commercial and industrial renewable supply. Uh, that market did not exist mm. in a big way before uh, essentially this coalition was formed. And uh, th that created a very powerful uh, center of demand for renewable energy supply, you know, in the in the past, before this, these topics um, uh, became very very relevant. Uh, particularly in Asia, the the uh, electricity model was very boring and simple: uh, generator, one single buyer. Now, particularly driven by the RE100 signatories, the whole topic of distributed renewable energy supply uh, has come into play. Again, the private sector driving a lot of the generation side, the private sector driving a lot of the demand side, and whatever the regulatory framework is doing, and you know, regulation will always be in catch-up mode to what's happening uh, in, in reality. Whatever the regulation is doing, uh, these types of constructs, experiments are being done and being put together, portfolios are being built, uh, portfolios are being financed with some friction, uh, but nevertheless, it's happening. And very interesting that uh, it's now going to the next stage because the buyer of green electrons, if it's a logistics company or FMCG company for whom a fleet operation is a big part of their business, uh, maybe it's outsourced, but nevertheless, it's a big part of the business. They're buying green electrons from somebody and suddenly they say, hey, what about my fleet? Can you also electrify my fleet? 
And that's where you get into this uh, EV as a service and all of those types of innovations. It's really fantastic. And this is way before anybody has thought of some sort of uh, regulation around charging stations or whatever it is. It's, it's happening. So I'm very uh, positive on the ability of those sort of actors mm. to drive some of, this, uh, some of this change and make these experiments happen. And then hopefully the, the more uh, traditional institutions, the, the, the pillars of the, of the financial world and the, the corporate world, uh, the multilaterals, the, the regulatory bodies, that then almost catches up. Yeah, that's what I've observed. Yeah, I think, I think the two things I've observed very similar. I think one is the business model change. Um, PwC CEO survey basically says, I think 50% of the CEO think that if they don't innovate in terms of their, how they operate the, their business model, they may not exist in hmm. the next decade. Uh, that, that's a very high percentage, right? And I think ESG creates that platform or system of, for people to start innovate on their business model, right? And that's accelerating in a very positive direction. A lot of things never existed before, now we're seeing it. The second thing I wanna say is I think AI or technology has a huge role to play. Um, yesterday I was in a client workshop and this came up. Client basically wants to know how AI can support their journey to net zero. Right, and this is becoming more common and more common in terms of given the complexity of the supply chain, right? The lack of data um, and a lot of large companies actually has a very complex system within themselves, right? How do you leverage AI to put everything together to accelerate? Because they've all made big commitments and a lot of CEOs actually, or CSOs are actually quite worried because they make commitments what, 20 years down the road, but they look at the technology today and they worry, are they able to achieve that? But with te new technology, with AI, I think we truly have a chance to accelerate in the next couple of years. Just, just on the accountability and trust, you know, we've seen for sort of the high level expert group, uh, we had Catherine McKenna here who, who chaired that. And uh, the Secretary General was let, uh, took that report and actually they, they led with a sort of no more greenwashing push, uh, which I thought was a little bit harsh, actually, in, in all honesty. It didn't, seem, it didn't seem, seem balanced and it didn't feel like actually every country in the world had stood by their, their commitments, uh, in all honesty. But the, there's been a really big push on uh, holding, holding business to account around net zero. So you've actually seen a rush and probably a lot of people in this room have stepped up in good faith, make long-term commitments, and then the, suddenly like the spotlight's on. And most of those commitments are in genuine and good faith. And it maybe takes a year or two to turn it into a full plan behind it because it's highly complex and it's long-term. Um, so are you seeing a lot of discussion around this accountability and trust issue? Yes, I think account Accountability and trust issue, a large part of it came from, we, we did an investor survey. There's a lot of commitments in the ESG or sustainable, uh, sustainable report disclosure. The investors lack the confidence in what they're reading, right? And that comes back to the data that you're disclosing. Are you responsible to your consumers, to the, your different stakeholders on what you're telling them? Taking it to the next level, the transparency comes from data disclosure and how good is your data, right? And that remains to be a challenge, particularly within our region, because it's so fragmented and the, the availability of the data compared to Europe or US is just not as robust or as mature as other region. That's starting to come together, but I think coming back to how do you then, I think first is disclose, right? taking actions. But second is, as you go through that maturity curve of your data, then you start build the robust governance structure around that to allow for future assurance. That is the only journey that you're starting to build trust uh, with the different stakeholders. And with that, the ecosystems of collaboration, innovation, will then start to, to get to that critical mass and then start to happen a lot more. Just, I'm gonna give a counterpoint. I think that's absolutely, uh, legitimate, but there's also, I think, another approach which I've seen inside, inside Tamasek or previously when I was in IKEA, 
if you can, when you can genuinely align with your employees, with your colleagues, you've got your purpose, your culture and values, your business model, your activities, so people can see, and your strategy, your sustainability strategies, and you can see authentic alignment in that, then you unlock huge amounts of power amongst, and, you, and that's huge, that's compelling. And you can do that, if you deliver that internally, first and foremost, your most important audience are your colleagues in this. Uh, then you can carry that through to customers or to analysts or whoever in the space. Uh, I just say we come to the audience participation moment, which is not dancing unless you want to. Um, <laughs> the, does anybody have a, a, a question or something they'd like to, to add briefly? I warned you it was coming to you, so you've had, <laughs> you've had 30, 45 minutes to prepare. Gentlemen there. Oh, we, we've got a mic coming to you. Hi there, um, Sam Kimmins, um, Director of Energy with the Climate Group. Um, what are the limits to engagement when companies are transitioning to um, a sustainable future but aren't there yet? What are the limits at which, which companies should start to say, that's enough, you're not going fast enough and you're not really serious about this? Should we be setting limits and should um, consultancies, should banks be starting to set limits on when they work with companies that say they're transitioning slowly? I have a very strong point of view on this one. Even though I'm standing here representing PwC, this is my very personal point of view. <laughs> As a company, you have employees you're responsible for. Therefore, even though we all advocate for accelerated growth, if you're not growing, if you're already struggling, right, pause and think where all the priorities are, right? If business doesn't exist, then you cannot even participate in the move to net zero. So I think there is that balancing act of what's very important. Now, having said that, I think there's a lot of things you can do to still do good but not investing in, I think that investment versus the return. I think it's what a lot of people are talking about, but I like to see it as a sort of opportunity, positive thing, right? What quick can you get out of it and think in that mindset? And then you have $10 in your pocket, right? You cannot be spending $100, right? And that's my personal point of view on this. I think everyone needs to move, but there is a limit to it. If I may add, I think it's, um leads in this part of the world in particular, leads into the whole topic of a just transition, which has been discussed uh, uh, again and again. And uh, the sophistication around that debate is also increasing. And I think um, this is where we do need to be quite nuanced and, and sophisticated in terms of what is the ask, what are the parameters, what are the boundaries, uh, and to make sure that uh, that ask is appropriate to the reality of the situation that we have. Uh, to give an example, uh, the, the, the whole topic around uh, banks and financial institutions uh, just completely exiting uh, coal and coal-related businesses, you end up in these, uh, what I would uh, describe as almost perverse situations where a coal company uh, which has had its business in the past uh, in, in, that, in that sector uh, is looking to pivot towards the green energy space but is unable to raise financing from banks because they don't want to touch it because it's a coal company, even though the asset in the project is a green project. So those sort of obvious situations, we have to have a, a, a way to avoid, right? And if we're not so dogmatic about uh, the overall limits, parameters, and more nuanced when it comes to the reality on the ground, I think that will go a long way. And then I think we can also uh, achieve the, the, the concepts of the, the, the so-called just transition. That would be my view on this. So can I, can I ask a question as well? <laughs> so I did a study a while back, a couple of years ago, and a number of, so this is an interview um, on particularly that sort of, are you investing in coal, um, companies that are dealing with coal and others? And a number of multilateral companies have made different standpoints in terms of, are we going to help them in just transition or are we just going to stop, right? 
Um, as a result of that, I think there is a number of concerns that came out of it, is that companies are, the public view of how a company is investing, right, in Copont, right, as opposed to not, there is a very strong opinion about this. And you get them in, you know, they get criticized, are you still, why are you still helping those companies, right? So what do you think of that? Hey, uh, great question, right? Um, look, I think uh, uh, the, the situations where I think these companies should be helped are situations where the existing business is a, is a legitimate business and there is a legitimate uh, commercially driven, ideologically driven, whatever, the driver may be less important, but there is a genuine steps being taken to uh, let's say build new renewable energy capacity or invest in an EV business uh, that will then hopefully grow, right? Uh, I, those types of situations and providing support and capital uh, to those sort of initiatives, uh, I find uh, very difficult to fault mm. or to say that it's uh, uh, somehow we should, we should not support those initiatives because this is real money, real dollars going into real new uh, green, for want of a better word, uh, businesses, right? Uh, so, of course, the, the, the judgment and the assessment is how do you uh, test that legitimacy and reality of it? And then we go back to the whole topic of greenwashing. And of course, greenwashing is something we want to avoid. But new investments into new capacity uh, that is sustainable capacity, green capacity, whatever it is, I think that uh, can only be supported. I, th I think I'm just going to wrap up briefly and then hang over to Helen. And um, I think just it's interesting. We're at a, just come back to your question. And we're, we're at a point it's increasingly clear what we need to do, pace of scale that's changed. I think if companies are legitimately struggling with the way forward, so there's, a de there's a question of technology resi resi readiness in different sectors and how fast you can go. If companies are genuinely materially engaged, Sometimes a plan can be to develop a plan. You don't have to have the full plan worked through. So I, I think you can see the companies that are authentically engaging on this. Uh, and every, you know, basically every company that has any materiality around carbon needs to be working to develop transition plans at this point in time. Uh, the exciting thing is, as, a, as an investor, you can see it, this is rich opportunity now. There are thousands, today's on, yesterday's entrepreneurs were trying to develop an app to help people get their pizza faster. Today's entrep young entrepreneurs are coming through and they're trying to solve these problems. So the growth companies, the startup companies, and also the opportunities looking at, at larger restructurings that we do. I'll just mention one, just to end on a non-greenwashing positive note as well, um, or two. We, we've invested in, uh, announced an investment, it's still going through approval, but it, it's public, with Brookfield in Origin Energy in Australia. It's a large gen tailor. It's got coal-fired power stations. Um, we'll be supporting the management there, doing an accelerated close down of those coal-fired power stations, rolling out more than 10 gigawatts, potentially up to 16 gigawatts of renewables, and flipping something that's a brown gen tailor to a green gen tailor. Uh, this decade and that's an investable opportunity it's exciting we're going to see more things like that and we can future-proof our businesses together uh, and uh, I think the the what next is about uh, looking at the power of groups like this coming together and realizing you can unlock things like uh, you said Marat with the impact of RE100 having surprising depth and penetration that just wasn't conceived of. So the people engaging with the climate group in, in this journey, uh, then you'll be surprised at what you can do together. But Helen, over to you for a final thank word you. or two. Yeah, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you um, to everyone. I want to thank everyone who's taken part in our spotlight sessions this afternoon and all the speakers this morning for the Green Energy Forum, the Steel Zero Summit. And you know, this our first Asia Action Summit, I think it's been a success. It wouldn't have been a success without all of your contributions and insights and all of you coming to join us here. 
Um, we've covered a really a lot of ground across today. We've talked about green hydrogen, energy efficiency. I think RE100's had enough mentions. Um, and, you know, critically, Asia's role in decarbonizing um, the, globe, the globe and, and the role in the decarbonization of steel. And, of course, we touched on India's G20 presidency. So we'll next be coming together um, climate group in September in New York, Climate Week NYC returns. I think it's around the same time as the India G20, so some of you might be drawn in that direction. Um, but all that remains for me to do is to say thank you very much to all of you for participating. Thank all our speakers, thank Ecosperity, thank all our sponsors, and to ask you all to join me in coming having a drink, which will be uh, somewhere through those doors, and people will show you once you've gone through where exactly that is. So thank you very much again to everyone. Thank you.